everybody welcome to another episode of the fixed fights podcast with kurt and ben as always i'm kurt i'm here with my main man ben what's going on dude not a lot just uh talking about mma per usual yeah yeah that is uh that is the usual and there as always is a lot to talk about wait real quick i gotta say because this might be the last podcast episode i think i can say it is that the royals have the best record in baseball and that might not even be true by the time somebody's listening to this but it's true right now amen I mean, <laughs> were they they were they weren't supposed to be good this year, right? No, but like they could have been. Like they're people about to come up. If you follow the Royals, you know there's like more not an unrealistic hope that they could have been good, but I don't think any of us thought. Like they started the season with like a three percent chance of making the playoffs, and now it's like a twelve percent chance or something. So, you know, what they won it in what two thousand fifteen? Mm-hmm. They went to the World Series in fourteen and fifteen, and won in the fifteen. Like, kind of nosed, so, nosed off that, right? Like right after that. That's the way it goes for small market teams because they can only, right, right. they can only afford like two years, and then once a player wins a championship, they're actually good. They want to go somewhere else and yeah. actually get, <laughs> go to and not, New York and make all that not money. Go to fucking stay in Kansas City where the barbecue is good and not much else. Nice. Right. Kansas City. Oh, are looking good. The Red Sox are looking good. Uh, for us baseball fans here all right let's get into some mma let's let's open up the show with some kind of uh i guess sad news um and sad for a lot of different ways diego sanchez if you haven't heard it has been released from his ufc contract diego was the tough one winner i believe that was i mean let me i can even look that up but dude that was in what like 2005 or six five or six uh-huh. Hey, you know, he, he Diego Sanchez fought for a title. He's got a million fights in the UFC. He's always been kind of one of those. I, I mean, dude, he's like literally like almost the definition of like blood and guts warrior, especially like in his heyday. I mean, that dude had an iron chin, great cardio, good skills. And uh, yeah, January 17th to April 9th, 2005. Crazy. And he's released from the UFC and he's caught in, in this weird I don't know what you want to call it, partnership or relationship, whatever, with this fucking idiot Joshua Fabia who just, uh, I don't know. I feel like he's he's using Diego's name in the complete wrong ways. Give me your take on what's going on. Man, I'm going to get fired up. I was getting fired up just talking to, like, random people about this, not even MMA fans, just, like, trying to explain to them this situation. Like, MMA is a sport that's filled with grifters to begin with. Guys like Dana White, right? Grifters. Like, people that are just trying to make a buck off of somebody else. That said, I feel like Joshua Fabia, Fabia, whatever he wants to be called, is, like, the ultimate fucking grifter. This guy is five foot two. He is short to his core, insecure to his core, and, like, is clearly just full of complete shit. Found Diego Sanchez at a vulnerable time. The yeah. guy was through a divorce he didn't feel like maybe his coaches and teammates could give him the attention that he was used to having because he's on the tail end of his career like that happens everywhere it's sad um and fabia jumped in and man this is kind of like a train wreck that i cannot look away from like did you watch those videos uh that diego sanchez posted of fabia like interrupting his fighter meeting and, and grandstanding i did, I did. Th- you know the thing that's sad is like you can tell right off the rip because it's supposed to be about Diego, and 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 I might I, I want to say this like I feel like the UFC, at least in everything that that Fabia and Diego released. Did you hear the phone call of like Hunter Campbell and Sean Shetley? Yeah. That made the UFC look good. That's they were one like, thing. I feel like the UFC handled it perfectly. Yeah. Right. Like I thought they handled everything perfectly, and I mean, dude, just Joshua Fabia is such an idiot, man. You know, he makes it all about him, right? And, and Diego's like on the back burner, right? And it's just like, and it just everybody... smells. Like, it just smells like lawsuit. It looks like he's poking around for a lawsuit. Am, am I am I right here? 
100%. It, I think Fabia is totally poking around for a lawsuit. I think that's why they... Did you see... I can't remember who reposted it, but one of, like, Spencer Fisher's friends posted a, a video explaining his interaction with Diego Sanchez and Joshua Fabia. Um, and he explains that, like, you know, I don't know if you're familiar, Spencer Fisher is kind of yeah. going through a lot of, of brain issues right now. Um, somebody who would have a valid claim against the UFC perhaps for like, you know, putting him through these things. But you get the sense that Joshua Fabia and Diego Sanchez, well, Fabia in particular, went out to visit Spencer Fisher to try to size up, like, is this going to be somebody who we can sue the UFC with? Whereas right. Diego Sanchez is just by all accounts, his heart is in a good place and he's along for the ride. So man, yeah, I, I agree with you that it makes the UFC actually look good. That, that picture. And did you see, this just was like a few hours ago. I hadn't read this until right now, but Diego Sanchez posting something on Instagram or social media saying that he's afraid that the UFC oh, might do like, right. Like this is all, I, I, this feels like Fabia to the max. I know Diego's always been a weird guy and he's Diego. He got into like, what was it? Like iodine water or whatever it is thinking it was going to cure cancer a few years ago. Like yeah, he's, he, He's out there, but this he's just, he's always been out there though. Always. You know, but like this is like way. Yeah, this is this is like too too far. I mean it's like a little about the UFC, but though. I mean this 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 one is like <laughs> this is uh, nonsense. And you know, if you listen to like some of like uh the the bigger media members like Ariel Hawani, Luke Thomas, they have all been messaged by Diego Sanchez. Even Daniel Cormier was saying he was messaged by Diego Sanchez, and they say they can just clearly tell that it is not Diego Sanchez talking like, you know, I, I guess, I don't know, Joshua Fabia has, like, access to his social media accounts. I mean, it's it's bad. It, it is really a sad situation. The saddest part, I think, has got to be just Diego's exit from the UFC. I mean, he was fighting Cowboy. I think at this point, Cowboy is is a little bit in better shape than, than Diego Sanchez at this point in his career. So Diego might not have won that fight, but he just still deserved, like, the proper send-off from the UFC and now uh, it's just a complete mess, dude. I, I feel bad. I really do. Yeah. And I think he, they would have given him a proper set. I think so too, whether he won or lost. If there's one, if there, if there's a type of fighter, the UFC loves to celebrate it's somebody like him who was Absolutely. like part of the company's growth. Like, you know, it's super, it's super unfortunate. And it does like, I get it's, it's grating to see a guy like Joshua Fabia have actually an impact on somebody in a negative way. I mean, what I mean, do you think? I mean, there, there's hungry organizations out there, you know. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like he definitely wants to fight somewhere else, but also now there's all this stuff out here. It just seems like he's a walking lawsuit. Like, yeah, he is. I don't think, especially other, while he's he's with Fabia. Exactly. I don't think other big organizations. I could see maybe like bare knuckle. Yeah, that's that's where he's gonna go. Not, you know, <laughs> Liability, I know, Jesus but I would Christ. be shocked if like PFL or Bellator even one picks him up. Yeah, I don't think any of them are going to touch him at least right now. Bare knuckle, probably, but uh, yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's it seems like a lot of the the MMA fighters are are seeing Diego's best interests are trying to steer him in the right direction, which is a good thing to see. I'm hoping that he can open his eyes sooner or later and realize that this is not the right guy for him. He's got to distance himself, but uh, I don't know. Only time will tell him Right. I believe he's still, is he still the last fighter from that ultimate fighter that's even still fighting? Well, Chris, well, Chris Lieben just had that retirement fight, but he also went through like eight retirements. It's gotta be. I can't think of anybody else who would even come close to still who stuck around the longest other than right. Lieben Sanchez. Yeah, that sounds right. Koshek's not fighting anymore. Mike Swick's not fighting anymore. Seth Bonner's not fighting. Yeah, it's got. Yeah, it's sad, man. Yeah, sad stuff. All right, let's move on to some uh, some MMA and some happier stuff that did happen. Oh boy, Yuri Prohaska and Dominic Reyes put on a doozy of a fight. Uh, that fight was awesome. I mean, obviously we got to heap all the praise on Yuri Prohaska for that performance, but. Shout out to Dom Reyes, man. I mean, Dom Reyes is was so close to holding a UFC title, and, and now the bottom has fallen out since. He's been knocked out uh, in two consecutive fights, but 
dude, Yuri put it on this man, and Dominic Reyes fought tooth and nail, went out on his shield, so I give him props, but, dude, Yuri is a monster. It's crazy. Like, his style, it feels like it should not work, especially at that big of a weight, but, man, is he making it work. The dude has, like, what is he? He's, like, 20, 28 and 3 or 29 and 3 with, like, 27 finishes. It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. He's, he's like, a kind of a cross between, like, a – Justin Gaethje a little bit, right? With his, the way he moves forward. Moves forward yeah. Totally unafraid. There's hints of Tony Ferguson, I feel yeah, like. in there. I agree. The way he moves. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that he's getting the shine and I'm glad that he's getting um, kind of fast-tracked probably to the title, I assume. I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk about what's next, but I like that I feel like a lot of um, fans got to see in these two, just these two performances against Uzdemir and, and Reyes. Now they got to appreciate how exciting this guy is. Yeah. I mean, and, and he's been, he's been killing it outside the UFC for a long while. He has a, he's one of those guys that came in with a nice resume um, already entering, right? It's not like he was being spoon fed bums out, you know, where he's fighting. He fought a lot of good guys. Yeah. His style, his style is, is madness, man. And the thing, you know, the thing about him too, and I talked to uh, Sean Humes on Twitter, great MMA mind was saying that he reminded him of like a uh, Sergio Martinez famous boxer from uh, Argentine. And uh, I kind of like the comparison, like Yuri gets hit and he gets hit a lot, but it's kind of, it's, it's hard to hit him clean just by the way he moves. He rolls with punch as well. Um, so while it looks like he's getting tagged up and he did get a little bit wobbled against Reyes, he it's really, really hard to tag him clean. And he just throws with uh, amazing power. Yeah, I think that's a super good observation because it feels like whenever he does get hit and he gets hit relatively often just because he he's there so much, like he's he's in range so often, but it feels like when he does get hit, it's almost like the other guy got lucky, right? It's yeah. not like when Reyes tagged him and he did tag him a few he times here, it didn't feel like, oh, Reyes just had this perfect jab or something or perfect left-hand counter. It felt like he's kind of swinging and hoping he makes contact and when he does you know like it looks bad because prohashka's hands are way down and he's like sticking his chin out but yeah i agree that like rarely does it feel like the the, sh the shots he's getting hit with are like because the other guy set him up for it even when he got taken down he got taken down i believe twice in this fight he didn't stop moving like when he hit the mat his back wasn't flat he was still moving he got up to his feet um Defended that guillotine well. Dominic Reyes looked like he had a kind of tight guillotine, but uh, yeah, dude, impressive, impressive stuff. I mean, kicks well, he punches well. He's got a good shin. The guy looks like the total package. And uh, yeah, we got to talk about what's next. Uh, I think there's two clear options for Yuri, and that's either wait for the winner of Glover Teixeira and Jan Blahovich, or possibly roll the dice and take a fight with. Um, Alexander Rakic. What do you think he does here? It's I feel like it's got to be the next type, the next guy up in line, unless Teixeira um, and uh, Jan some goes weird or is a draw or something bizarre. I feel like I'm I'm all the way in on Prohashka um, facing the winner for the next title shot, or you know for for the title shot next rather. I'd like for Rakic like. I wouldn't hate like that fight would be super super fun. That'd be awesome, yeah. But like, why kill off a real a, like a brand new contender? You know, yeah. like both these guys in a division that has felt like it's been starving for like legitimate contenders for a while. Like, it's starting to get fresh. I I don't want to see either one of those guys like lose their chance. I'd rather see Rakic fight somebody like Anthony Smith or something. Get him one more fight, and then he can fight for a belt if he wins. Yeah, Rakic wasn't all that impressive either in his last fight when he, uh, you know, nearly up or not even not even narrowly, but he outpointed uh, Tiago Santos. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of wish with you um, on him waiting again. Rakic is a is a very dangerous fight, and I think everyone is super high, rightfully so, on Prohashka. I gotta say though, man, I, I you know, we I, I thought he looked good with his get up game, but I think Jan and Glover both have the ability to really slow down fights. They're both good on the ground, especially Glover. I think that would be really interesting for Yuri, and I think those are both really tough matchups for him. I, I agree, and I know we just got done saying he's, like, so hard to get hit cleanly, um, 
But I think we've seen we should not doubt the Polish power here. And I no. think Jan is actually a, a pretty crafty and tricky little counter striker. I think if somebody's going to have the the power at 205 and the timing to um, put Prohoshka's lights out, I think the champ is is the guy to do it. I think those are. But that said, I think Prohoshka is right there with them. Like all these guys we're talking about are very kind of neck and neck, it feels. If Jan does win against Glover, and they do Prohoshka versus, versus Jan next, that fight cannot be in America. <laughs> yeah, they can't be in Las Vegas, Nevada. They gotta, they gotta do that either somewhere out there, you know, Czech, either Czech Republic. Uh, they've gone to Poland before. Have they done? They've done UFC shows in Prague before in the Czech yeah, Republic. Yeah, yeah, they did. They did Prague. That'd be done huge. Poland before. I mean, you got, you got to go out and, and to one of those Slavic nations, man. Yeah. Oh, wait, you can't be putting these guys in Las Vegas, Nevada, or like Arizona, you know? Yeah, and I feel like both those guys are so, like, this is going to sound weird, like, proudly European. Yeah, like they are, absolutely. Like, especially Euro, Yuri Prohoshka. Like, that guy is not American. Like, he's American. I think Americans appreciate the way he fights. Uh, but with the fucking ponytail and everything. Oh, it's that, not a ponytail, bro. It's an antenna. Antenna, whatever, to get he was, better. He, dude, he, he lit, um, did, did you hear the thing where he literally said he was getting, like, space right. waves that, to, that like, walked him through the fight or something and told him what to do? I love that guy. His style that was awesome. makes me think he might not stick around for a super, super long time. But while he's here, it's a fucking party. So I'm on. I'm on. I'm on. I'm in for the Prohashka party. What did Mike Chandler say? I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. I think uh, I think your Prohashka's on that same way with like the second he steps in the cage. That's what he's thinking. How many people are going to grow their own antenna after this fight? Dude, I might. Yes, yeah, you should It'd be great. <laughs> Uh, if we look at the co-main event, uh, Giga Chiakadze looks really freaking good. He lands a beautiful liver kick on Cub Swanson, puts him away. I think Chiakadze was, I want to say, like, ranked 15th or something coming into this fight. He is now, um, he's, I mean, he's won, what, uh, like, seven straight fights? He called out Yair Rodriguez after this fight. I mean, dude, I have no idea. What Yair's doing? Well, he had that suspension. Zabit is even talking about retiring. But, uh, dude, Giga is another just monster in this division. Needs a fun fight. Dude, I think a Yair Rodriguez fight would be amazing. Any of those. So now Giga is now ranked 10th. Oh, um, nice. The right division. There is just, if you look uh, just above him or below him, they're all bangers. I mean, could you like 15 right now is Hakeem Dawadu. Um, above Chikadze is Shane Burgos, which is like banger C city. He's fighting um Barboza. Very so the, soon. These guys, a lot of these guys are matched up already. Josh Emmett's coming back eventually. Josh Emmett is six above him. Yeah. I mean, Calvin Cater, Yair, I would love that. I feel like Chikadze is not how well, I don't know if they I don't know. I would like to to see that Yair Rodriguez fight. It just would surprise me. I feel like Chikadze, they're still going to put with like lesser known names, yeah. like a, a guy like Burgos or Josh Emmett even, or Arnold Allen. That would, Ooh, that, would that, be interesting. that would be a good one. That would really let me know a lot about Arnold Allen. Not that the last fight of his against what he fight Sadiq Youssef didn't, Sadiq Youssef, yeah. but I think this would, I don't know. There's, there's just a ton of fights. I think any of those. Fights. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's a really uh, nice big addition to that uh, uh, division that is always really good. Um, looking down the rest of the card, Jan Laba and Dustin Jacoby fight to a draw after a uh, intense stare down. I mean, come on. Like, Dana White was just, just giving uh, Sean Shelby shit about the uh, uh, the push with uh, Jakar Close and uh, Jeremy Stevens. I mean, dude, you like, how many times has Jan Kutilaba weighed in and done something stupid at the weigh-ins. He's pushed dudes before, like, like you got to know to get in between this guy. I mean, you know, he gives him the old uh, collar tie. I thought it was actually kind of funny. But, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think I've seen anybody, like, do the <laughs> collar tie somebody. The slap. Like, yeah, who great. starts a fight like that? I, I guess he does. He's one, of, dude, he's one of the funnest first-round fighters out there, though. I mean, he has no gas in the second or third ever, but... Uh, Love that guy in the first round. I like the whole craziness. He, he's a funny guy. Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a weigh-in champion for sure. He is. 
Uh, Sean Strickland, that dude is freaking nasty, gets another win. He's due for a really interesting fight, I think, because he handled Christoph Joko uh, relatively well. His striking is really good. He's got nasty boxing. I'd like to see him get a big step up. Let me just see if I can pull up the uh, rankings quick. And he's like Chikadze. He went from, I believe, 15. Now he's at 11. Um, I didn't even know he was ranked in the top. 15. I mean, yeah, I think he's he looks really good at middleweight. That 170 earlier in his career, I think, was was killing him. Um, I mean, if he wants to step up, you got guys like Kelvin Gastelum coming off a loss. Um, That's a nice step up. Uriah Hall coming off <laughs> the yeah. point uh, talk about. I mean, any of those. I, th I I thought Sean Strickland's like boxing looked really clean here. Um, and I think it's a skill set that can give a lot of guys problems, especially if he starts flashing a, a little. Not that he doesn't hit without power, but um, – I think a lot of these like bigger hitters at 185 he needs to compete with in in like just the pure athleticism realm. So if you look at it, I mean, I think I think Derek Brunson's going to get matched up with Uriah Hall. Honestly, uh, Shabazian is an interesting one, dude. I know his stock is at an all time low, but Kevin Holland saw him straight yeah. really freaking good. Yep, because they both talk to each other in the cage. Yeah, that, that would fight makes fight. a ton of sense. And I I don't think Sean Strickland is going to be. Uh, Shoot and take down after takedown. Mm -mm. Yeah, no, I actually like that fight. I think yeah, that's, I like that's my too. final answer. Sean yeah, Strickland against Kevin Holland next. Same. Uh, Mirab Dabalos Bili gets a win. Uh, dude's a stud. He, another guy, deserves a big step up. I'm surprised they had him all the way buried on the uh, prelim opener. What if they got him ranked? He's ranked 11. That almost seems a little bit too low at this point. I like see him in there with like a Pedro Munoz. Marlon Marais is on the downslide. That could even be an interesting one. Uh, I think they're teammates, though. Or no, least... I don't think so. Because uh, are they? Because uh, it... well, aren't they all with like? Well, this is with uh, Sarah Longo. Okay, I get and them. Then, and, uh, like, Mark Henry crew. Yeah, and... Marais is with uh, Mark Henry. Okay, yeah, I'd, I'd be down with that. I mean. He's had kind of a weird. Let me pull up his his. I feel like he's had a weird schedule in the UFC. I'm talking about Marab. Well, he's had he had that one like uh, decision loss that he shouldn't have lost, and then he had the weird um, thing with uh, Ricky Simone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess he fought John Dodson. I just I feel like he's fought a lot of like and Gustavo Lopez is a striker, but I feel like he's fought a lot of grapplers. Yeah, like. I'd like to see him against, especially at 135. It's wrestler heavy. I don't know. I don't have strong feelings. I think uh, he came into the UFC and people were really, really hot on him, or at least after like this little run, people are really hot on him. But he's kind of in close fights, you know? Like, I don't know. Well, he doesn't finish people, really. He just... Shoot, yeah. He's a monster, though. I mean, his cardio is yeah. nasty. His chin yeah. is nasty. Yeah. I want to see him get a big step up. Yeah, for sure. I think the last thing we uh, talked about on this card was uh, what was your opinion on the illegal up kick? Uh, Luana Pinheiro, Brandon Marcos. I saw Marcos calling her out on social media for like faking it a little bit. And I think there's probably some truth to that, but like it is what it is. As Max yeah. Holloway would say, like, you know, we only Luana Pinheiro can know. Uh, but if it's if an illegal strike lands, which one did, like that's yeah. that's like that's the game you're playing right now. That is. Um yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I didn't think it it didn't land that hard, it looked like. Um that's you know, that's another gray area rule too. Like, you know, if the fighters are both grounded, they and she was it looked like she was kicking off too to like try to stand up, like not intent I don't I don't know. Yeah, it's it's another thing that happens. I definitely don't think it was as hard as the Aljamain Sterling knee. Yeah, but uh, I mean, yeah, she she made the fight. It's it's they they're never they have to take the fighters like never can the referee be like you know what we all know that wasn't that hard we know you're fine yeah because exactly. you can't because <laughs> like if the fighter says I feel dizzy or dazed or whatever they they can't let the fight continue so I mean. That sucks. I, they might run that one back because it was still just yeah, under, right. you know, not that. And I guess there's a little bit of beef to it, but fuck. Randa Marcus's record is now 10 and 11. That is yeah. wild. 
She's had a lot of fights in the UFC too. Yeah, she's on their good side. So maybe if if she's still with the UFC after this fight, they could run that one back. Yeah, four losses in a row. She is. Yeah, but look at look at check. fucking Amanda Hebas, Mackenzie Dern, Conoco Murata. She's fighting really Kirby good. Nicole, Nicole Mikhaevich, Carla Esparza, Alexa Grasso, Julian Lima, Nina Ansarov. Yeah, she's fought Angela Hill. Fought yeah. a lot of really good chicks. Yeah. Um, all right, let's go to the action that is coming up this weekend. There is a UFC card coming up. I think the main event was finally announced. Uh, Michelle Watterson is going to be taking on, um, excuse me, Marina Rodriguez. I didn't hear, though, if it was going to be three or five rounds. It says on topology, it says five. I, yeah. that's, I, I didn't read anywhere for sure. I would be shocked if it's three just because I feel like especially Michelle Watterson would accept it as a five rounder fight. Um, and it's at flyweight too, which is also kind of weird. Michelle Watterson probably could fight at one Oh five. I don't know, dude, to me, I feel like you should have bumped Neil Magny, Jeff Neal to the main event. I feel like if I'm looking at that card again, yeah, I don't know. Marina Rodriguez is, is on the come up for sure, but I feel like that, that is probably the most meaningful fight on this card. Um, I would I would have they would never do it, but I would have loved them moving Ben Rothwell and Philippe Linz up to the main event. <laughs> just as a fuck you, like we're still gonna put heavyweights in the main event. I don't care if they're like on losing streaks and shit. Wow, yeah. Let me yeah, see. September. September. Yeah. This is this is a tough fight for her. I oh yeah. Say. And didn't this fight come like kind of out of nowhere too? Or were they scheduled for, for later? Let me see. I, I think it... No, I mean... I don't, I don't know how this fight came together, necessarily. I think it kind of makes sense, both on one fight win streaks. I do agree with you that it's a really, really tough fight for Michelle Watterson. Yeah. I mean, you could just... It's a fight that's almost definitely going to happen on the feet. Um, Rodriguez, with that, like, heavy knockout of Amanda Hebus in her last fight, like... I remember talking on this podcast right after that fight being like, holy shit, have I been sleeping on this woman? Cause she can, she can crack. Um, and I think Watterson, like you said, like she could fight at one Oh five. She has yeah. fought at five. Like size is going to be an issue here. Power, Power is going to be an issue. Yeah. Going to be a huge issue. The only way I see Watterson winning is like kind of a, I mean, she had her last fight against Angela Hill. I felt like Watterson showed, how she's going to win moving forward, which is like kind of being grittier, tougher. Yeah, she is. Knowing how to win rounds, like tacking up point, racking up points rather in close fights. That's the only way I see her beating Rodriguez here is like landing a few more kicks at range or like no selling anytime she gets hit, things like that. But I think the actual fight, Rodriguez is way more powerful, a little bit slower for sure, a little bit less dynamic of offense, but like, kind of a traditional tie style. I think she's going to crack uh, Michelle Watterson when she's like trying to land some, some spinning kicks or if Michelle Watterson tries to box with her, I think she's has no luck either there. I think Rodriguez has better hands. Yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be a tough, uh, tough one for Michelle Watterson. The Coleman event, Donald Cerrone taking on Alex Murano. Um, I love the Diego Sanchez fight for Cerrone. I also love this fight for Cerrone. I'm glad that he's not like, Again, like Alex Morono is solid. We saw him lose to Anthony Pettis in his last fight. He's kind of alternating wins and losses in the UFC, but I think this is a good level opponent for Donald Cerrone. Um, you know, he hasn't, dude, Donald Cerrone hasn't won since he beat Ally Quinta back in 2019. He's lost four straight and then had the, uh, what was it, a draw with uh, Nico Price that was then overturned, I believe, right? It's a no contest, yeah. Yeah, because it looks like Price tested positive for marijuana. Still, uh, still doing that in 2021. Except for Florida. not not the smoking weed, the the overturning decisions for marijuana. I mean, come on, it's true. Fuck. <laughs> uh, anyways, yeah, I, I think this is a really good good fight for Cowboy. I don't think it's a um, shoe in that he wins by any stretch, but I like the matchmaking. Yeah, I mean, especially on like what a week and a half notice, like. Yeah. Considering I did see Kevin Holland throwing his name in the hat, and I thought, oh shit, maybe Kevin Holland's going to fight Donald Cerrone. But um, yeah, I mean, this this is 
serviceable. He's fighting another kickboxer and a guy that he could beat, probably, but we'll see. Yeah, we shall see. Again, Neil Magny, Jeff Neal on this card. I think this is probably the biggest fight of the card. Um, really, actually, no, it's not, but it is a good fight. Uh, dude, I, man, how am I sleeping on this fight? This card is not that bad, honestly. Uh, why was I under the impression this card was kind of terrible? It's not. Dude, because Gregor Dana. Gillespie's fighting Carlos Diego Fajeda. Yeah, the main event. I feel like they could have even went with that for the main event. It's because you hear that main event and you think that's got to be the best fight on the card, right? Um, and then you see, yeah, this this Carlos Diego Fajeda fight is phenomenal. I said, this is a this is a really interesting one for Gillespie. The Riddell, Brad Riddell fight was going to be awesome. I'm glad that Gregor is back in there really quick. Uh, he's coming off a what year and a half layoff, something like that. He got man, he got dropped, put out by Kevin Lee. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how he bounces back because again, Gregor is one of those guys like once he fights, you don't hear from him. Until he fights again, you know, he doesn't he doesn't do like any media. He doesn't really do social media talks. No shit. Um, doesn't even watch MMA. He literally says like he has no interest in MMA, doesn't follow the sport. So, yeah, it, it's I guess maybe that's why this, this slept up on me because you don't really hear about him too much. But I'm pumped for it. Yeah, no, I'm excited. And I'm excited stylistically how it happens, because I'm not sure Gregor is going to feel super comfortable taking uh, Carlos Diego Fajeda down. That guy is is quietly one of the better overall like jujitsu players in the UFC. I feel like, and he's he's he can work off of his back. Yeah, he, like sweeps and everything. He's totally he's, comfortable. He's good on his feet too. Mm -hmm. I mean, he yeah. had that banger with Benil Darius in his last fight. That fight was awesome. Yeah, they can both crack. I'm yeah, I'm really like interested and curious to see how it how it plays out. You know what, dude? I gotta I gotta. I, I'm I'm mad right now. Oh, and I'll tell you why I'm mad in a sec. Amanda Hebas taking on Angela Hill, um, the main card opener. That's a good fight, too. Yeah, I'm into that. Angela Hill only fights killers. That's it. Yeah. Only fights killers. Every fight, dude. And, like, loses a ton of split decisions, right? Oh, yes. Loses a ton of split decisions. Hebas is coming off that loss to Marina Rodriguez in her last fight. I'm going to tell you while I'm mad. I did the prelim primer with uh, Daniel Vreeland this week, and I think we are both on the assumption that Ben Rothwell was on the main card, and he wasn't. I would have liked to talk about Ben Rothwell on the prelim primer. Uh, because I'm, as as are you, I am very pumped for this fight. I love the Ben Rothwell fight. The dude's awesome. Uh, he's a big boy. What has he? I assume he's on. Yeah, he's on, he lost his last fight against Marcin yeah. Tybora, Philippe Lins, PFL champ, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, who has had a rough go? He's 0 and 2 in the UFC. Yeah. Wow. That's all right. Two big boys with nothing to lose. Sign me up. Yeah, I hope Ben Rothwell gets the knockout and uh, does the weird laugh, gets on the mic, says something crazy. Yeah, he's funny as hell. Yeah. Um, I also, I did the prelim primer. Uh, the featherweight fight between um, Ludovic Klein and Michael Trezano is going to be a banger. That's probably. Uh, my favorite fight on this undercard. Phil Hall's Kyle Dawkins is going to be really good too. Yeah, it's a pretty damn good card, honestly. It's I'm I'm coming around on it. I think it's just that the main event is underwhelming, and then you also hear that the co-main event is like Donald Cerrone against Alex Morono. So you kind of like, at least for me mentally, I like check yeah. out on the rest of the card. Oh, the rest of the card is probably not gets, great. Yeah, it gets juicier before that though. There's a lot of like really. Like guys like Jeff Neal, Neil Magny, a lot of these guys like coming off losses, but are still like really high up. Diego Fajera, Gregor Gillespie, Amanda Hebas, like all these fighters are great fighters just coming off a loss. So the, this card is going to be preceded by two good cards. We'll start off on Thursday night. By the way, I can't wait till uh, one. I honestly really like the one on TNT thing, especially on Wednesday nights. Like pretty soon, I'm imagining we're going to get a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday one PFL Bellator UFC. And that is freaking awesome. Yeah. Sign me up. Um, and this past week at past last week was the first time I watched one like live on Wednesday night. And yeah, it's, it's it was good. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. They do the, they do the YouTube fights before it. Uh, I like it. Fabrizio Verdun making his debut this Thursday, taking on uh Hedden Ferreira. 
I don't know too much about his opponent, opponent but it's going to be interesting to see Fabricio Verdugo's first fight outside of the UFC. He is 43 years old. I'm not sure how much left he has in his tank, but again, heavyweight is one of those divisions that, um, I mean, you could look good later into your career just because most of the guys are older as well. He looked really good, honestly, in his last fight with Alexander Gustafson. Wasn't that the fight where he came in as like a plus 200 underdog or something wild and he literally just smoked Gustafson? So yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Size matters. Experience matters. Um, and I don't, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't have a ton of other thoughts on the PFL heavyweight division other than Muhammad Usman, who I'm excited yeah. about. Other than, you know, beyond just the fact that he's obviously the champ's brother, like the guy is a goddamn monster. He is humongous and scary yeah. as hell. He is. Um, Kayla Harrison is in the co-main event taking on Mariana Marais. Uh, Marais has a lot of fights, so we'll see how... Yeah, she's got a lot of fights. She's only 25 years old, and she's got, what, she's 16 and 10, 26 fights. Yeah, Kayla Harrison's look, a monster. The, the issue is, too, like, look at Marina Marais' record closely. Yeah. Uh, her last fight was at lightweight. Then we go one before that. That was yeah, also at lightweight. But as recently as December 2019, she was fighting at 135. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So PFL is on big ESPN. This this card, which is pretty cool. I feel like if there was any chance for a crossover fight, could it not be the PFL and the UFC due to the, the ESPN connection? Like maybe, let's say Amanda Nunes wins her next fight, and then beats Valentina Shevchenko, and then it's like, dude, Kayla Harrison's just mopping the floor with these women here. We've seen Kayla make 145. Maybe they're just like, hey, cross motion fight, Kayla Harrison, Amanda Nunes. Who knows? I mean, maybe Probably not. If, if, <laughs> Probably not. I, don't know, I mean, you got to think ESPN has quite a bit of sway over what That's the what UFC saying. does. And, and I think the UFC typically says, no, we don't do cross promotion fights. But if ESPN says, hey, we're like, you know, we're the ones basically paying your bills, which they are with their with the deal, like, uh, let's do an ESPN plus pay-per-view with Kayla Harrison against Amanda Nunes. Like, right. I don't know. I would be shocked. But yeah, I think you're right that if there were a time for a cross promotion to fight, a cross promotion fight to happen, it would be. In a time like now, when but when two major, major-ish promotions are on ESPN, big ESPN. Because let's be honest, I don't even know who really is in the lightweight tournament. I feel like we talked about this before, and there's a fighter with like two or three fights in it. Kayla Harrison is going to mop these women. She's going to win another million dollars, which is all great. But I feel like the competitive side in her is eventually going to want to get some competition, right? And uh, there's no better competition than Amanda Nunes in MMA right now. So I think that could be something interesting in the future. Um, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, they're like, they're, PFL, this is of the, the three seasons that they've had women's lightweight. This looks like the best one so far. But yeah, like there's a fighter who's 3-0. and um Taylor Guardado is officially 0 and 1. She fought nice. twice. She fought twice or three times on an at an Invicta Phoenix Rising tournament. So she, I guess she technically had three more pro fights, but they were all in the same night. Like Elena Kolesnik, I've seen fight in Invicta at 145. The issue is, is all of these women, like basically none of them, are actual lightweights. <laughs> like right. Caitlin Young. Fought in Invicta for a whole long time, again at 145. Cindy Dandois, long time, featherweight. So PFL, their their women's lightweight division is for sure getting better. They're getting higher quality fighters, but the issue is none of them actually fight at lightweight other than Kayla Harrison. Yeah, that is very true. Um, so, see, so that takes place on Thursday night. Friday night, Bellator is back, Bellator 258, and they honestly they have a really, really good card. I feel like it's, since Bellator has been back, dude, their cards have been excellent. Their production looks good. I love that they're on Showtime. Um, really, really like what they're doing. Obviously, the downside of this was we lost Yoel Romero and Anthony Johnson. Romero did not pass a pre-fight physical. I heard it could be uh, like an issue with his eyes or something. 
Uh, but again, the man is what, 30, 43, 44 years old. I mean, not that big of a shock. The good thing is we lost him in the tournament, but I think Yo Romero still has a big enough name that you could do the Anthony Johnson fight at any time. Uh, you could do Romero for a title, I think, at any time, just based off his name. So they're not in the worst position with that. And the good news is they also kept Anthony Johnson on this card. He's going to be fighting Jose Augusto. I don't know too much about him. I watched a couple of his fights. He's uh, on a five-fight win streak. His last fight was via Arm Triangle and Bellator um, all the way back in, well, no, in April. So he just fought, and we have no idea what Anthony Johnson is going to look like coming into this fight. If we got to be honest. Uh, yeah, but I kind of like this more for Anthony Johnson. I mean, I was obviously like the Yoel Romero fight. I was like way more excited yeah. about but for Anthony Johnson, <clears throat> not fighting an MMA since 2017, like having a, a, a bit of a step down um, or at least against a guy with way less experience kind of makes sense. I do. I will say, like, I got a bone to pick. I wish Bellator had slotted in our guy, Julius Angliscus. I know. Yeah. Like. <laughs> He's he's like very clearly like he was ranked five in Bellator. Like he is very clearly like a guy that probably makes the most sense to slot in. He also won the official like yeah. um what's the word? Uh replacement maybe a fighter fight. Like what come on. Maybe he has an undisclosed injury or yeah, he couldn't take the fight. Crazy. I'd like to think, but I mean when it was announced that you messaged me, like, is he gonna <laughs> slot in? I'm like, yeah, I mean I I think it of course he's gonna slot in and here we are. But you know what? Light heavyweights get hurt a lot, so maybe he's he'll still have another chance. I mean, what we know about Anthony Johnson is he has insane power. Since 2012, his only losses are to Daniel Cormier. Both fights, he hurt Daniel Cormier, um, and then he was taken down and submitted eerily similar in both fights. Uh, but yeah, Rumble has a ton of power, and dude, if you look at it, the pictures, he looks really, really freaking good. He looks like he's in great shape. He gave his body, what, four years off, um, 37 years old. But I, I, I imagine the power is still there. The cardio is going to be a question, but, uh, dude, I'm really excited for it. I can't wait to see him back. I'm excited, too. I hope it doesn't go longer than, like, two rounds. I don't want, I'm don't. i sure his cardio is a question, and I don't want that question answered throughout this entire tournament. I just want to. I just want him to go gangbusters. Maybe his cardio will fail him after seven minutes like it did against Daniel Cormier and that's fine, but I don't want to see it go these Anthony Johnson fights going long. Well, dude, if he wins this weekend, I think it sets up Bellator for, for I would say, one of their biggest fights in a while. He's going to fight for the title against Vadim Nemkov. I think Vadim Nemkov is is kind of on the cusp of, of breaking through, right? I think he's one of the best light heavyweights in the world, and if you can get him in their title fight against a former UFC title challenger, Anthony Johnson, who is very well known, I think that is going to be great for Bellator and Vadim Nemkov. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's the name. I know Nemkov has uh, a beatdown of the year against Ryan Bader, yes. but I think this a win over um, Anthony Johnson, for whatever reason, in my mind or in the public's mind, feels like it would be a bigger deal. Yeah. Uh, I mean, dude, he's, he's a big name. I mean, he literally came very close to winning a, a UFC title twice. Yeah. If not, yeah. Daniel Corby is chin holding yeah. up. Um, the main event is Juan Archuleta taking on Sergio Pettis for the bantamweight title. Dude, this fight is excellent. Juan Archuleta is a beast. Sergio Pettis has looked really, really good in Bellator. I feel like Sergio has always been kind of on the cusp of greatness, but he can never break through. Uh, this is time to shine, man. This is a really good fight. Yeah, a, a super great fight. I do think it's a – Sergio Pettis is still in his, his 20s, so I, I, you know, I think he's going to have more than – like he can continue to be in these spots. I do think Archuleta's wrestling it might be a little bit too much. I also think Archuleta's just like pace in general might be too much. Um, because people forget, like, look at Juan Archuleta's record. Like he has only lost to Patricio Pitbull yeah. before that his last loss was in 2015. So like, you know, undefeated in Bellator outside of losing a close fight, I will say, with like Bellator's current best pound for pound fighter. And I would say Patricio Pitbull is one of the top five pound for pound fighters in all of the world yeah, right now. So, I agree with that. And that was and that's at featherweight. So fucking Archuleta, you know, he's slowly getting his due. And I think if he if he does what I think he'll do and take down and beat up Sergio Pettis here, um, he'll get even more due, hopefully. The odds are very close. Archuleta is about a minus one sixty to one seventy favorite. The comeback on Pettis is about 
135 to 150. So relatively close fight. Man, I would, I would put the juice on Archuleta here. Yeah, those are good odds. I mean, look at Sergio Pettis's like recent. I don't want to like disrespect any of his recent opponents, but like his last win, I thought I felt like Van Dejas kind of blew that fight by being like real tentative, extremely passive. Yeah, and I, I, I may have even picked Van Dejas going into that fight. Um, I don't know. I don't want to. Sergio Pettis is obviously super, super talented and a dangerous fighter, but Archuleta is like a true championship level stuff. Yeah, it's going to be a really good fight. Patricky Fieri, um, Pitbull, the bigger Pitbull brothers taking on Peter Quayley. It's a little Pitbull brother SBG showdown. You never know. The Pitbull brothers could be fighting after the fight, too, with corner men from SBG. So keep an eye on that. Uh, the main card opener, I kind of like it, honestly. Michael Page taking on Derek Anderson. Again, Michael Page is fighting a what blown up lightweight, also making him come up another five pounds to 175. But I feel like this is a a relatively tough opponent for Michael Page. Derek Anderson is very good. You like this fight for Page, or do you think we're still dilly dallying with him not fighting who we should be fighting? I think. I mean, if you look at the Bellator rankings, like Derek Anderson is what like five, I think, or he's somewhere. he's very good. Um, I still. It would be weird if they give Michael Page another title shot off of this win, considering, you know, I think the people that for Michael Page to earn another title shot, he should be fighting a guy like um, Logan Storley, for well, example. I was just going to say, and Logan Storley is on this card. Like, or how about I mean, Lorenz Larkin? I mean, well, Lorenz Larkin is fighting at middleweight. I don't think he's moving up, but those are two names there that I'd rather see him in there with. Yeah, I have no idea why, but they're just not going to. I mean, the thing with. I do like this fight because Derek Anderson is is pretty fucking good, yeah, he's but good. he's not gonna, he's not going to take MVP down. He's like, I interviewed Derek Anderson. Um, check that out on Fan Sided MMA, and I really like his like attitude. This guy is a pure. He's somebody that I describe as, at more than one time in his life, like many times in his life, this guy has had his hand in either an engine that's on or a animal that's still alive. This guy just has no a switch that says you should stop because this is dangerous. That just does not exist for Derek Anderson, which I love in a fighter that said he's, I mean, he flat out told me like, well, all I'm going to do is like go out there and trade punches with him. Um, that's how he, that's like how he approaches fights, um, which stylistically favors Michael Venom page, but he's got a good chin though. Yeah. He's got a good chin. He has a bunch of fights he has, I mean, the bulk of his career is at 55, but he is six foot tall. He's fought a few times at welterweight now. So, you know, I guess it's a step up for MVP. But yeah, like, could you imagine MVP against Logan Storley? We'd be having a totally different conversation right now. I mean, that is literally who he should be fighting. Yeah. They got him. They, I mean, they literally have him ranked, what, number one or two in Bellator, which is ridiculous. <laughs> having him over, you know, like, dude, Logan, awesome. Logan Storley is what, uh, 11 and one in his career? And I feel like he has a better resume than than yeah. uh, Michael Page at this point. Well, they gave Yaroslav uh, Amosov the title shot, rightfully so. Yes. But why why was Yaroslav Amosov ranked under MVP? Like, that makes no sense to me. You know what's kind of sad, Ben? My, MVP, dude, I feel like, dude, me and you have been doing a podcast together since, I believe, our literally, our first podcast together was going into that Mayweather-McGregor fight. Mm-hmm. And we've been literally having the same gripe about Michael Venipade since then. And he's now 34 years old. At this point, like, whether he wins or loses against Derek Anderson, I, I, I just don't think we're ever going to see him take the proper steps up. I mean, he stepped up one time in his career and he got knocked out. So, yeah. like, I don't or, know. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a shame. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it always, like, hits the pavement. Let's say he beats Derek Anderson and they give him another title shot. He's for sure not going to beat Douglas Lima. No. And I actually think he has less of a chance against Yaroslav Amosov if that's the champion. I don't like, think he beats so Logan Storley either. I don't think he beats Logan Storley. I should have pulled up the Bellator rankings in front of me. But there's a whole lot of people that can competently wrestle and grapple in that division that I don't think he beats. I don't think he beats Ed Ruth if yeah. Ed Ruth were to go back to 170. who's yeah. That's a guy whose career has kind of fallen on skids lately, but I would still pick Ed Ruth over MVP. Sadly, I think Ed Ruth is is contemplating retirement at this point. You know, I know he just got a job with uh, Wolfpack, Wolfpack 
wrestling club. He's even flirted with the idea of wrestling some matches. I hope he comes back to MMA because I do. I love Evan Ruth. He's so freaking good. Um, fell on some hard times, but yeah, we shall see. I think Derek Anderson is is a live dog in this fight this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, dude, even this undercard is really good. Josh Hill, Rufian Stotts is solid. Former champ Rafael Carvalho is taking on Lorenz Larkin at middleweight. Patchy Mix, Albert Morales. Sadly, we were supposed to get Patchy Mix versus uh, James Gallagher. That would have been awesome. But uh, Albert Morales is pretty damn solid, too. Dude, I'm still really, really, really high on Patchy Mix. Yeah, I, I mean, am, too. His fight with Juan Archuleta last year was, like, sleepy. One of the better fights of the year. It was. Very good. He's 27. I love the way he fights his like grappling go forward kind of like just get it to the clinch type of style um i'm excited about this card yeah henry corrales is on it uh eric goyito perez johnny eblin's another guy to keep your eye on he's undefeated uh middleweight with really good wrestling the aforementioned logan storley yeah this is this is honestly sneakily one of bellator's better cards they've put on it's a really freaking good card yeah i'm i'm totally into this card for sure the best event of the weekend for yeah. sure um, I guess the last bit of news uh, we didn't cover at the beginning, but um, actually we can talk about some fights that are being announced or have been announced. I feel like we haven't done that in a couple weeks. But uh, Nate Diaz versus Leon Edwards has been pushed back to UFC 263. I'm wondering how they're going to handle it because 263, isn't that – that's headlined by uh, Adesanya Vittori. And isn't the title, the title fight rematch – uh, between the flyweights on that card too. Uh, that sounds right. You have to look this up. Um. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Adesanya Vittori two, Figueredo Moreno two. Okay. So I'm wondering how they handle this. Do they go three five round fights, or now do they bump Edwards Diaz down to a three round fight? Because remember, this was supposed to be a five-round co-main event. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I think they could make it five. We just we like literally just had uh, a pay-per-view with three five-round fights at the top scheduled for five rounds. They were all finishes. Um, I think they could do five. Just why not like blow it out, make it big? I would be shocked if I would expect Figueredo Moreno to be a banger again. I would be shocked if Adesanya Vittori goes the distance. So, yeah, yeah, I think make it make it a five rounder again. Yeah, I agree. Um, is that, I believe this that card's really freaking good. By the way, Damian Maya, Bala Muhammad, Paul Craig, Jamal Hill, and Brad Riddell, Drew Dober is the current main card. You know, you threw a Diaz, um, <laughs> Edwards fight in that mix. That looks really good. Yeah. Bangers everywhere. I'm trying to see where they're like. I feel like there were some other good fights that were announced. Oh yeah, Sean O'Malley is taking on Lewis Smolka at UFC 264. That's a weird. I was gonna say I feel like that's a weird one weird for matchmaking. for O'Malley. I guess we're still trying to give O'Malley like very stylistically favorable fights or something. Why? Why? I can't like. He's another one. Like just give him a step up. It seems like he wants to step up. Why don't we? Put him in there with the Dominic Cruz. The Dominic Cruz fight seemed like it made all the sense in the world. Yeah. I mean, I mean they did not go with that. I mean, Smolka can't really doesn't have great wrestling, but if Smolka gets on top of Sean O'Malley, that's a <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a risky fight. I'm trying to see, were there any other big fights that were announced? Um let's see here. I don't not that I can that I'm seeing off the top of my head here, or yeah, no big ones. I mean, I'm trying to think. Was there big shit announced in like the celebrity boxing? I feel like there was a fight added to that Floyd Mayweather yeah, card. Um, Chad Ochocinco is going to be fighting on that card. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in in jujitsu, Gordon Ryan got a match. Um, yeah. Mikey Mitsubishi is getting another no gi match, was it, which is exciting. Um, Pat Pat Downey, notorious amateur wrestler, is going to make another foray into submission grappling at Third Coast Grappling. He's going to be fighting MMA pretty soon. Yeah, like why hasn't he already? Yeah, like, I know, I know. Fucking wrestling teams can you get kicked off of before you just say? <laughs> You're right. Let's, let's go fight. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
All right, dude. I don't think I got anything else. Yeah, same for me. This is a pretty good weekend, man. I'm I'm excited now. Yeah, now, are... now that we talked it out, I'm 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 excited. UFC card, low key good. Bellator card, definitely good. Kayla Harrison, yeah. like fighting, I think is always a little bit exciting. So I'm excited about this weekend. Yeah, same here. Um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, MMA. Uh, check it out. We appreciate you all listening. Follow us. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, wherever you follow podcasts. We'll talk to you all soon. No escape, can't step to this. Face the pain.